fund trader today uh, as well with uh, Spencer Regal, Spencer Regal, a hedge fund uh, manager. Uh, and uh, he's going to go through how he trades later today as well, 4 p.m. over in Australia. Uh, it's, now, the, the time here, 4 p.m., uh, is these are all East Coast times. We have Brad Gilbert. Uh, he's a bank trader. Uh, and then tomorrow, Mark, Marco uh, uh, Bozing. Uh, on Thursday, new uh, update here for everybody. This is great. Uh, 2 p.m. Uh, East Coast time, Scott Polsini and... Uh, now we have uh, Brett Steenbarger as well. So as you guys know, uh, uh, Brett Steenbarger, a trader psychologist, had written about Scott Pulsini, how he was such an exceptional trader uh, in his one of his books. Uh, and um, uh, so they'll be on together uh, in an interview on trading size. And then on Friday, 10 a.m., we have Al Vingemore, a hedge fund manager as well. Perfect. And, uh, Spencer, can you go to the yep. next slide? Okay. Uh, let's, let's go through the disclosures quickly so uh, no one gets in trouble. Uh, general disclosure, all book map limited materials, information, and presentations are for educational purposes only and should not be considered specific investment advice nor recommendations. In the risk disclosure, trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. So next slide. And uh, OK, so uh, a few news uh, items and why we're doing this um, special event uh, webinar series uh, with institutional traders is because the next week uh, we are having this CME competition uh, and we're going to give you a million bucks trade in SIM. Uh, this is our first CME competition we've had. Uh, and the theme here uh, is trading uh, scary size. Uh, you'll have a lot of liquidity uh, to get in trouble with a lot of a lot of uh, uh, leverage here. Uh, it starts uh, October 29th. We'll be putting the link here into the chat for you. It's uh, competition.bookmap.com, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, please uh, sign up and uh, enjoy. Uh, we have lots of surprises as well. And let's see uh, some other news. Uh, we've talked about our our beta programs here. Uh, if you're interested, email, email us at beta at bookmap.com. Uh, get access to our new multi-account add-on. Uh, if you're trading like with Fast Track Trading or uh, another prop firm, uh, now you can connect to multiple accounts. You take one trade and it will spin it out into multiple. Uh, we also have the Market Pulse web, a new heat map, uh, and there's other uh, things as well. So just let us know uh, in the email what you're interested in. Uh, we have our new blue jacket uh, competition. Also, uh, we have this every month. It starts on the 10th of the month. So you might want to join that and then join us uh, at the Bookmap Academy as well. Thursdays at the market close. OK, and so today, uh, Spencer Regal, hedge fund manager. Uh, this is the first time uh, we've had a, a webinar with Spencer. Uh, very happy to have him here. So, uh, Spencer, why don't you uh, uh, give us uh, your background in here and take it away? Sure, sure. Uh, first off, thank you guys for having me on. I have been familiar with Bookmap for years now, um, so it's awesome to to get on and talk to everybody. So, here is kind of my background. You guys can see it on the screen. But what I'd like to do is go a little bit off script uh, and talk about the journey in which I've had in markets. Um, since kind of the inception so i didn't really go the traditional route and traditional route is going to college uh getting a finance degree right going off getting a master's getting hired at a traditional bank whether that be jp morgan or goldman sachs or potentially even going the proprietary realm of uh working under a kind of a, as a junior trader and then kind of working up to a senior trader getting your own book all those kind of things right and so while those are all great paths uh, and paths that many traders do take. The route in which I took was I was actually a med school student. Um, I was fascinated with markets and my first conversations with markets were dating all the way back to the age of nine. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a grandfather that was involved in markets and so at some particular point in time at the, uh, at the ripe old age of third grade, I decided to talk to him about markets. So it's kind of been my life. It's what I've been surrounded by. And um, so I remember conversations about liquidity, balance sheets, uh, 
basically how to value a company fundamentally um, in middle school, right? And so while that was interesting, I kind of migrated into the medical realm and, and thought that I was going to be a doctor, um, but transitioned fully into trading into instruments, into uh, managing capital um, around when I was around 17, 17, 18, right? And so that's when I re-entered the space. And knowing that I was kind of still in the medical field, I knew that I was going to have capital coming in. And I had a, I had a real interest in managing that capital and understanding what that meant uh, and making the best decisions that I thought were possible at the age of 17, right? And so um, that process and kind of why I'm talking about it is I started in the retail space. And so knowing, knowing BookMap, and we kind of talked about before hopping on the call was uh, a, lot of, a lot of people here are, are likely going to be in the retail space. And so um, I'd like to talk and spend time today talking about the retail space, but also uh, I have transitioned into the institutional side of the trade, uh, and there is a difference, right? And so how we execute, the size in which we execute is going to be different than than where I started, right? And so everything changes when you basically have a mandate. Um, and so what I do today, and kind of to speed up the process so we don't talk about this for, for a full hour, is... Um, I spent years in the independent retail space, uh, trading with and learning from uh, traders that were in the hedge fund industry that were either managing their own hedge funds, managing their own books, um, all the way from equities futures or equities to uh, futures, to commodities, to uh, options on futures, to kind of a transition into the crypto space where now I predominantly trade spot markets, over-the-counter derivatives, uh, and I have had experience in, in some of the more exotic options uh, as well that, uh, that exist in the over-the-counter uh, the, over derivative space uh, on the institutional side. So uh, what I do now is, is primarily, uh, my, my job is uh, the chief options strategist and crypto trader at Dharma Capital Trading. So I am representing Dharma Capital Trading here in today. Um, but what I focus on on a daily basis is strategy development, uh, enhancement of yield generation, um, but most importantly, risk mitigation uh, and making uh, the most risk adverse uh, decisions, right? And so that's basically my background. So I'm going to break it down and talk about kind of how we're using um, how we're using some of the analytics, both in terms of data to make executions on a daily basis, how my perception of, of trading has changed, which to me is, is kind of the biggest and most important piece when we're talking about trading is once you step out of the retail space and understand how institutional traders are trading, it's different. Um, and I mean different in terms of you're not trading one lots anymore. You're trading significant size, and that size has the ability to impact markets. Um, you're also judged and monitored based on your performance, both on a client relationship, right? But also on a performance basis within whether that's a firm, whether that's a proprietary firm, whether that's an independent hedge fund, a larger firm. Um, Everything is performance based, right? And so I think it's great that hearing from Brett Steinberg and, and more psychologists within within the trading space, there's a large difference on the psychology side entering into the institutional side, right? And so to bring it back full circle, right? Where did I start? I started in retail, right? And what does that mean, right? I'd walk in every single day and I'd I do a little bit of market prep. Um, and that means, okay, I traded U.S. equities, and I, so I'd get to the desk. Maybe I'd get to the desk around six in the morning, seven in the morning, Eastern New York time, right? And I'd I'd, I'd do some research, right? So what happened overnight, right? Where was where was the Nikkei trading? Where was uh, some of the indices trading, right? The Russell, the Dow, the Nasdaq, um, the ES, right? Where are we at in terms of the larger indices? Where are we at in terms of the macro, right? Was there a war, right? What happened overnight in the war? Um, was there larger 
macroeconomic factors, mm-hmm. right? Was there a rate change out of the ECB? Was there a rate change in China, right? Was there a rate change out of these larger central banks? Um, all of that was my prep to start the day, to, to have an understanding of, okay, if I'm going to come in and, and take a trade, right? My job is to express an opinion. Uh, my opinion is the market's either going to go up, the market's going to go down, or the market's going to do nothing, right? Um, that is in what we consider to be your linear products, right? Your spot markets, your futures markets. Um, but then also in the option space, as I transitioned into the option space, I learned that I could bet on the market doing nothing, right? Which was that third component. Or the market doing something, but not doing it as fast, Um and that brings a whole nother dynamic, right? So, okay, I'm looking at the news. I'm looking at these rate cuts. I'm looking at these rate hikes, right? How is that going to impact markets here and now? But where is it going to impact them over the next 24 hours, the next 48 hours, the next 72 hours, right? And that was my transition into uh, some different components that were options. Um, and so I spent a lot of time understanding and, and doing that. Right. And so as I would step onto the desk at seven 30, I would come in and, and the day starts with risk. Right. And so from a retail perspective and from an institutional perspective, it's the exact same game. Right. Our job is to make sure that we are here tomorrow. Right. And so what does that mean? That means that we are focused on risk first before we're taking risk, right? So it's a it's kind of a catch-22. We want to make the best bets uh, in terms of our risk, right? And so there's different there's different institutional words for this, whether that be a, a sharp ratio or Sartino ratio, right? Um, but at the end of the day, fundamentally, it's the exact same thing. It's a risk reward basis, right? And so that is exactly the same in the retail space to the institutional space, right? And so I would come in and say, okay, what's my risk capital today? And maybe that was a hundred bucks at that time. Um, and I would say, okay, what's, what's the best use of my time today to bet that amount of money, right? And so I would, I would scan the stocks, right? Or I would scan the indices and I would look at technicals. I would look at macro. I also was very, very uh, into the options flow space uh, and spent a ton of time within um, market flows, right? And so options, buyers uh, hitting the market and how are they hitting the market on a microstructure that would impact the underlying, right? Which is another conversation for there another day. Um, but all of those things I would take into effect or take into account. And then I would I would hit the desk, the market would open, the bell would hit around 9.30, right? And, and I would make a decision, right? And so that decision, I would likely wait. Um, and then I would wait for the indices to come down to a key level, or I would wait until a stock would come down to a key level. I'd wait for some of my indicators. Some of my indicators were okay. Uh, are there going to be option call buyers today? If there's option call buyers today, well, I want to be involved. Where do I want to be involved? at X price, right? There would be a technical level that I'd want to be involved at. And basically I would buy and sell and I would, I would limit my risk, right? Based on that. Um, that fundamentally is the exact same as in the institutional side, right? And so kind of what I'm trying to do today is have great speakers talking throughout this series. Um, but with the idea in mind that you guys are going to get a million bucks in capital, right? In sim capital um, to trade with, which either is going to be larger than your bankroll now, or it's going to be a little bit less than your bankroll now, depending on your size. It creates a problem, right? And so fundamentally, what's the difference between an institutional trader and a retail trader is the size of the account, right? The scenario is this, right? So today, let's say these are all, these are all, hypothetical scenarios, right? In the institutional side, I don't, I, my job here today is not to talk the book and not to kind of express our positions, but to more or less give you guys tools, give you guys kind of my thought process and my experience on both sides of the trade um, to hopefully where you guys can learn from something, right? And so 
as in all streams that I do weekly with Bookmap, I like to talk top down from kind of a philosophical level down to kind of the application and the strategy side. And we are absolutely going to spend a ton of time there, um, which I think is going to be great, but I want to bring you into the larger picture, right? So today, instead of coming in and saying, hey, you have $100 to lose, right? It's your position and your mandate today is to put on 500 Bitcoin, 1,000 Bitcoin, right? You want to put it on at the best price, right? And you want to lose the least amount of money in doing so, right? While that is an incredibly simple objective, in theory, it's hard, right? Because while that is a very static mandate, right? It's status quo. You got to put on a thousand Bitcoin today. Okay. That's great. That's not going to change, right? The only thing that's going to change is time in the market, right? So as time progresses, right? You got to put it on today before the New York close. Okay. Well, as time progresses, my opportunity to put on that size drastically decreases. So my time premium changes, right? And the way in which I think about risk also changes, right? So if right now, let's say it's 10 o'clock, 10, 18, New York, I still have until 4 p.m. to put on a thousand lot of Bitcoin, right? And let's make sure that we have a Bitcoin chart up here so that we can have some visuals going on um, while we talk about it. I still have time, right? So if the market's going to trade higher, I'm not too concerned about it. As the market's going to trend lower, I'm in a good position because I know that people are willing to sell to me I'm a buyer today, right? I'm not always a buyer, but if I am a buyer, I want to get the best prices, right? And so psychologically, how am I thinking differently about that? Well, I know if I got to put on a thousand lot, how am I going to do it? I'm not going to do it in one clip. Why? If I hit the book for a thousand lots, right? Let's look at book map right here. You can see that there's 115 on the offer here another 100 on the offer here. That's likely HFT, right? That's working a bid offer spread. If that's the case, they're incredibly fast, right? They probably have co-located servers in which that the moment I send a market order, they see it, right? So if they see a thousand lot come into the, come into the book, what are they going to do, right? They're going to step off the offer immediately, right? My market order is basically telling the market I'm willing to buy at whatever price there is a, a best offer at. Is that what I, what I actually want to do? Absolutely not. That's not my mandate, right? My mandate is to get a thousand lot on today at the best price, right? I lose all control of that execution if I send a thousand lot to the market and I say, hey, here's my mandate. You guys do it for me. They're not incentivized to fill me at the best price. Right. So instead of a game of risking a hundred dollars, it becomes a game of strategy. Right. I'm not looking at the market in terms of a two dimensional plane anymore. Right. I'm not looking at it as it is up and down. I'm looking at it through time. I'm looking at it through volatility. I'm looking at it through all these different aspects and continuing to observe the liquidity in the market, knowing in my head, that the moment I show my hand, the market's going to adjust to me, right? So theoretically speaking, if I were to throw a thousand lot out here, I would sweep this book, right? And this is the multi-book perp, right? I would sweep this book all the way up to like probably 68,000, right? Somebody would fill me at it 68,000. How would that fundamentally happen, right? That's a market maker that's sitting on the screen. There's many different market makers, right? Whoever's willing to take the risk will step in. They'll sell me the thousand. HFT will have a field day and they'll trade against me on that thousand lot because I just opened up a vacuum in the book. And they'll trade against me in terms of price. They'll trade against me in terms of fills. It's just going to be a bad fill, right? At the end of the day, right? And so I know based on looking at book map here, I got 100, 130 on the offer. I got 100 relatively close here. And then I got 100 on the bid. And it's basically a 200, 200 lot spread in the perp market, right? 
up and down 100 points, right? That's the market in which I'm working with today, okay? The next component is, okay, what levels do I want to execute this at, right? That's, that's a huge important level, or that's a huge important factor, right? When I used to come into the desk and trade in the retail side of things in terms of, okay, I'm risking 100 bucks, maybe I was trading a, a flag pattern, right? Maybe I was trading uh, a resistance um, low, or sorry, resistance top and a support low. If we broke structure, right, I'd sell them off, right? And if I only had 100 in the tank, and let's say I ripped 100 on one trade, well, I was done for the day and there's nothing I could do, right? So then I'd have to take down my unit size, right? And think about, okay, well, there's a 75% chance that this flag pattern is going to work, right? Well, that's, that's a pretty good odds. If it doesn't work, well, I'd like to still be involved, right? I still want to take partake, right? Because at the end of the day, a flag pattern and statistics is the law of large numbers, right? So as you partake more, you have the opportunity to fit those numbers more towards the mean, right? So if I miss on a 75% chance trade this time, it actually is a higher likelihood that I'm going to make on the next time, right? Based on that theory, right? So I want to be able to be involved there. I also need to think about bankroll management, right? There's a lot of stipulations and constrictions that I had um, that I wasn't impacting markets. So if I was... If I was working size, right, I, I just wasn't. So I, I was able to come in and, right, so let's say there's 100 points here that I could take for 200 coins. Well, if I'm only working 100, 100 bucks, I don't even have to think about liquidity in the market. I don't, I, I, none of these things factor, right? I can wait and be patient all day, right? Time isn't even a factor, right? Why? Let's say at 359, I still have to put on the order, right? I know I'm not going to impact markets. So I don't even have to factor in time, right? I don't even have to think about that dimension, right? I can wait for the best price and where I feel most comfortable with the trade working to my to my liking, right? To best fit those odds and then just take my shot then, right? If I'm working a thousand lot, I can't do that, right? Because if I were to if I were to just hit the market, we saw based on book map right here, what would happen, right? So I have to be methodical. I have to come in with a plan, right? I have to think about, okay, let's say that these larger factors in terms of the war, right, are largely seen and portrayed in the news as a quite negative event, right? And a risk event in the market. Well, I look at it as an opportunity as a buyer. Right. Reason for that is, OK, if you're going to sell them down and because you're afraid of the war and my mandate is I got to buy a thousand of these before 4 p.m., sell them to me. Right. My job is not to look at the macro risk in this moment. Right. I absolutely, as I think about strategy and strategy development and all these execution aspects, absolutely, that's a factor. But after I've done all that work and I step onto the desk, if my mandate is to buy a thousand off of this level, that's my mandate. My job is to get the best price that day, right? And so all of that talk, let's talk about how to define those levels, right? And let's get into kind of the strategy and application. Um, I do want to spend an enormous amount of time today uh, with a Q&A session. I know Bruce is also on this call. I'll open it up to him to let, let make sure that he has, uh, he has something to do, basically. He's a busy guy. <laughs> but. <Sure. laughs> um, but I also, knowing coming from the retail space, transitioning into the institutional space, that's what helped me, right? Sitting with guys that have been in the institutional side that had to work size, sitting, having conversations, taking them out to coffee, you know, whether it be a good day at the, at the desk or a bad day, talking to them about their strategy, right? And so I value that as I hop onto any call. Um, and so I do want to, I do want to keep an enormous amount of time for that. So what you're looking at in terms of my screen, right, is price map on the left and book map on the right, right? So if you're unfamiliar with price map, price map is our proprietary data and analytics. 
there's a ton of intricacies within it to spare everybody with kind of uh, the education lesson. Um, it gives me the levels in which I would like to work today, right? In combination with Bookmap provides a both a macro sense of execution and then Bookmap is that micro sense of execution, which I'm going to explain right now, right? So you are currently looking at a daily structure of Bitcoin on the right, and you're looking at a weekly structure of Bitcoin on the left, right? Based on these data and analytics, being a buyer today makes a lot of sense, right? There's tons of timeframes in which we are monitoring, right? To make it easy, we're looking at the weekly here and the daily. To make larger time decisions during this week, uh, and then microstructure decisions on the daily, and then in combination here with Bookmap, right? And so why does this all matter, right? So hypothetically, let's say we're buying the market today. Our mandate is to buy 1,000 Bitcoin, right? How do we do it? Well, based on price map, I know that in these brown levels here, I want to be a buyer, right? Knowing that if the market's going to base, it should base over the previous day's low, right? Fundamentally, that's a positive market, right? Because if it's going to base over the previous day's low, where is it going to go? It's going to test this previous day's close, which you see here is the PDC. And in simplest terms, if you pull up a chart of Bitcoin and it says, are we up or down on the day? If we close over the previous day's close, you're going to see a green number next to, the, to Bitcoin. Why? That's a positive day fundamentally, right? So if I want to be a buyer of Bitcoin and I have a thousand lot to work, how am I going to do it? The best price is, first, we got to look at risk. Right, so where's our risk? We want to be buyers within this yellow area here on this weekly chart, right? So regardless of the news, right, that's my mandate today. Okay. You could say, hey, China's gonna come out and ban Bitcoin, as they have oftentimes in the past, for those that are very familiar with Bitcoin and crypto trading. I would say that's great as long as it fits my levels right and maintains this lower this lower metric area here i'm a buyer and i'm a buyer of a thousand lot and i want to do it as close to that price 66800 as possible right where am i concerned about the trade going lower previously say low right don't have to make it complicated don't have to think too hard about it if it's on the previous day's low, that opens the door for a trade lower. But more specifically, that opens the door for a trade under this, this metric boundary in which I don't want to partake in, right? Okay, that's great. I have a thousand lot to put on, right? I got to do it by 4 p.m. today, right? It's 10.30 New York. I know, the guy down, down the uh, four seats from me on the desk, he's going to go to lunch at 12.30, right? That means he's going to be off the buy button at 12.30. He's also probably going to be off the sell button at 12.30, right? That's another factor, right, that I need to think about. So if the market goes dead at 12.30, right, because everybody, you know, steps off their desk and wants to get a bite to eat, am I going to get the volatility that I need to get the best fill? Maybe, maybe not, right? So I know that there's key factors in the day in terms of time that I have the best ability to get the best liquidity, the best ability to get the best volatility. And I know that based on a particular time of day, certain entities, whether that be a pension fund, a mutual fund, larger capital uh, managers are mandated to make execution decisions only through a specific time of the day, right? So, a really good time to make executions is 9.30 to 10 a.m. New York. Why? Larger money is making decisions at the bell, right? They're gearing up their executions, right? You have all these buy and sell orders that are, are hitting the market. Citadel sitting there on both sides of the book, right? Providing that liquidity, 
right? The Virtus, all of these kind of larger liquidity prov or providers, right? In the crypto space, it's different entities, right? Let's say maybe you have a, a DRW Cumberland sitting on the book. You might have a Jump Crypto sitting on the book on both sides, right? But I know that decisions are going to be made then, right? So my expectation is there's going to be a little bit of volatility then. I might have an opportunity to get a clip off on there, right? What's a clip? A clip is, okay, if I got to work a thousand lot today, maybe I work this in segments, right? Why would I take all the risk at one price when I know I have time right now on my side to work the best price, right? And so obviously, if I get that move right here down to that 66,800, well, that's a great price, right? Because I'm risking zero with infinite upside, right? That would be perfect to think about. However, that's not trading, right? Trading is their slippage, right? So while I say 66,800 is the figure, look how we've traded today. We traded right under it. We traded right back over it. We've traded right under it. We've traded right back over it three times, right? Are you going to sell into the market? Under these lows, just to have the market revert on you? Good question, right? The answer to that is absolutely 66,800 is the level in which, hypothetically speaking, we don't want to be involved today. So we need to lighten up, but we also need to give it a little bit of time to see if that's a real breakdown, right? And so we play this game all day to get the thousand lot on, right? And so while the mandate of stepping onto the desk at 7.30, maybe I get up a little bit earlier. I was on the desk this morning at 4 a.m. Um, that might be a little different on the retail to the institutional side, right? Um, but the mandate's simple. The execution is complex, right? So let's say we've gone through these levels, right? So 66,800, that's our level. That's what we want to work today. We want to get as close to that as possible. Anything under 66,800, if we have 1,000 on, we want to make sure that we at least downsize and we want to get the best execution for that, for that uh, downsize as we possibly can. But let's take this to book map, right? So we have the macro sense of these levels in which we want to work. Let's understand who's also sitting in the book. And let's talk about the psychology of the paper sitting there as well. So something incredibly interesting in which you guys will see here is this is the Bitcoin per, uh, perpetual multi-book, right? Perps are interesting. Why? Fundamentally, perpetual markets, they are different. They are a CFD, basically contract. They're a perpetual future, right? Um, they've actually existed for quite a long time, but crypto reinstated them in sixteen with the inception, uh, the first inception uh, launched on BitMEX, right? What has that done for the crypto space? I mean, it's been fantastic. Why? Because it's aggregated liquidity, right? So it's concentrated liquidity, whereas previously, let's say in a calendar future, you would have what's considered to be um, a segmentation of liquidity, right? Where you have, let's say, your front month future, your, your back month futures, right? Your three month futures, your six month futures, each of which have different market makers, different per participants, you have buyers and sellers, right? Maybe you have miners in there that are looking to uh, downsize or sorry, hedge off some of their forward risk. Um, you have options desks that are just in the duration to hedge off some of their delta risk in those expirations. Um, all these different things. However, if you think about $100 to make it simple and you have 12 products to scatter it through, it makes it incredibly hard to provide the same amount of liquidity across what we call you serve um, when you can just put $100 in the perpetual contract and stimulate this uh, more liquidity, right? So perp markets are great in, in crypto for that reason. They help with the segmentation of liquidity. So as we look at the books, right, that's the why of why I'm looking at the perp market right now, right? Where's the liquidity sitting in the book? I also know that margining is a little bit differently on the back end of a perpetual contract, right? So a spot market's one-to-one, -one, you come in with a hundred bucks, you buy a hundred bucks with a Bitcoin, right? 
the difference is it's one-to-one -one with cash balance, right? And so you can think of that as basically a cash account. Uh, in a margin account, right, or a perp account, you can think of it as a margin account, right? So some of these venues will give you 50x leverage, right? And so I know if you have a 100 bucks in your bank roll, you could stimulate 50x that amount, right, or $5,000 in the bid right or on the offer right so that two-sided coin one is it creates a more liquid market but it also creates a more volatile market without diving too much maybe we'll do that another time or i'll cover it in our weekly stream and book map discord um but it creates more realized fall as well which is interesting to think about so Microstructure, let's look at this. Our mandate's a thousand lap Bitcoin. Um, how do we do it? One thing to note is we got 400 coins sitting around 66, 600, right? 120 here, uh, 360 here, right? So 480 coin sitting there. Basically, that's where I'd be looking to put this, this risk on. Right, so our level is sixty six eight hundred, but that buffer that I'm willing to give it is down to that buyer, right? Reason for it is if I'm moving a thousand lots, if I sweep the offer, I'm gonna I'm going to sweep this book, right? I don't even think there's a thousand lot offered here, all the way up to sixty nine six hundred, right? That's a problem, right? But I do know I have a willing buyer down here at 66,600, right? So if I'm willing to work 66,800, I have an out at 66,600, right? So I got to think about my risk first. So if I'm wrong, right, and I'm buying these lows, right? And let's say China actually means the real deal this time, and they are outlawing crypto, right, and Bitcoin, and that does have a significant impact on the buy side flows of the market, which then creates a price decline, well, I need a willing buyer. Right. And knowing that I have a thousand lot, I need it with the least amount of slippage possible. Right. So this player, whoever this player is, is incredibly key into my decision making for the day. Right. Why? Well, let's say I put a thousand lot on and I get a perfect average, 66,800. Right. Okay. Well, let's imagine that the book is thin like this on the, on the sell side, that's a problem. That's a really big problem for me, right? The reason for that is I can only sell off 200 to the closest market maker, right? But the moment I hit them, what do you think they're going to do? Their job is to warehouse inventory, right? So mathematically, they have all these formulas and how they operate, right? Which you can search up some of the market making formulas mathematically quantitative finance all that kind of stuff but they're going to back away right they only have x amount of capital to risk right and so while their mandate is to sit in the book if you look at some of the the market making contracts with their bit they only have to sit in the book for x amount of hours per day right and each exchange makes a negotiation with these market makers that they have to sit in the book for X amount of time during the day, right? So the moment I hit them for a thousand lot, they might step completely off the book, right? So while we see this as a bid offer spread of a hundred lot, that might be 10 market makers with 10 lots, right? Each, that it just keeps refreshing bid offer, bid offer, bid offer, bid offer, right? And it creates this tight spread but the moment I come in and I sweep for 200 lots, right, that might not be in their quantitative model, right? And so five of those might step off the book for 30 minutes or 15 minutes, right? Because they also have to manage their risk, right? And so now the market changes, right? And so the market becomes a 50 by 50 offer, which is a problem because I have a thousand, right? And so what I don't want to get into is a scenario in which the offer here is light, but then the bid is light when I have to sell, right? I want to be buying into 
this support in terms of other buyers because I know as long as I buy in front of them, there's a willing buyer down there that I can just sell right back to if I'm wrong, right? That's a great risk reward, right? I'm not so concerned about the offer being light, right? Because that's great. If there's a short side to the trade, right? Because I know there is. If I come in and I buy a thousand lot, somebody had to sell it to me, right? So whether they're selling me directly out of their inventory or they're selling me directly on a directional thousand lot bet short, as long as I have my risk covered that I can sell to, then let the thing fly, right? I'm not concerned about a trade to 70,000. That's that's money in my bank, right? So that is how thinking about these levels um, matters, right? And so if I were to look at book map here and say, okay, there's 364 here sitting on the book. They haven't changed, right? The way in which these bids sit in the book matters as well, right? I'll give you a perfect example. Let's pull up ETH. I've been watching uh, the ETH spot market, the USD spot market, right? way in which this offer has been moving, right, signals to me that it's not a static paper offer, right? So when I think about risk, I'm thinking, okay, that is an algorithm, or potentially that is something that has the ability to just at, adjust at will, right? So I'm going to bring into a question immediately when I'm thinking about risk, who that entity is. Is that a willing seller or are they just sitting here in the book, right? Or are they a price dependent, right? Meaning if we trade up here, are they going to shift a little bit higher, right? And they're, they're hedging off some of their gamma or some of their, their options positions, right? Um, which is a whole different thing, right? And so they're dynamically adjusting their gamma, their uh, delta, which we will also see in book map, right? That matters. But the looking back at where this paper has been sitting and resting, it stayed the exact same for a significant period of time. So that's a huge factor in thinking about where do I put on size? Right. So my assumption is, and this could be also correct or incorrect, is they're a willing buyer. Why? Markets come down, tested here, they bought it up a bit, right? But they haven't moved. They've just sat there and soaked to that bid. Right. So that means I know that if I come in here and buy a thousand lot, I have a willing willing buyer, two hundred points lower. I'll give it a little bit to give to them. But let's say even I downsize a little bit, right? And I see their bid getting chipped away a bit, right? So they go from a 363 down to a 250 and I'm not willing to sell the full thousand. I know I'll just sell them 200, see if they refresh and just test these market levels, right? Um, the next piece obviously is where's that next resting paper? It's stacked throughout this, this area here. So while it's undefined on my slippage to the upside, it's relatively defines who my slippage on the downside and it aligns perfectly with my expectation and also my mandate on the day. Um, so I think that's, I think that's a lot. Um, we have 15 minutes left in kind of the, the segmented call so far. Um, but I would like to open it up. Bruce, I don't know if you have any questions kind of off off the top of your head, anything that I skipped over that you have questions on or you think that would be valuable. Um, but funnily, what changes from my experience as a retail trader to an institutional trader is how you manage size and how you think about the market broadly, right? And so instead of thinking about a technical pattern, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, I'm aware of the technical patterns and I'm, I'm monitoring those and looking at those and making some decisions based on those. I'm looking at flows. I'm looking at everything in which is talked about in trading. But the fundamental difference is the psychology of putting that, putting that size on uh, and the strategy in which to do it, knowing that it's all on a performance base. Yeah, that's uh, 
that's a lot. Um, and uh, I, I bet you probably uh, uh, pine on for those uh, retail days uh, where you can uh, uh, trade a, a few coins here and there um, <laughs> compared right. to a thousand. Uh, uh, this the stress in, involved in the you know how to get in and out um, is uh, uh, stressing me out just listening. Right. So, yeah. Um, no, uh, lots of questions uh, here. Um, okay. And um, uh, yeah, but guys, uh, please get your questions in. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've uh, got a uh, uh, a professional here. Uh, this is your time uh, to get your questions in uh, for uh, those things that you've probably always wanted to ask. Uh, one thing that just came to mind. I mean, I've got a whole list here, but um, immediately, like uh, you, you, about your your prep. Uh, you, you spoke about at the beginning. Uh, yeah, you can be prepared. And of course, this comes with experience over years. Right. However, you you never know. Um, and and I'm not talking about geopolitical war, like some something like, you know, happens and like, oh, my God, it's out of the blue. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about like, um, you know, FOMC is, uh, you know, next week or something like this. And what does the market think of it? And, you know, right. you, you, you can look and, and, and think, okay, well, I imagine there's going to be traders that think this or that, but um, they may start moving it. Uh, and, um, and, and the move happens, you know, um, several days in advance. Uh, right. how, how, how do you prepare for and how do you adjust for something like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, to me, that's the fun part about trading. Um, there's so many different, I mean, the market in itself has so many variables, right? And there's, I mean, we can say that there's almost infinite amounts of variables. It's a variable in itself in which we can't predict. Um, there are repeating patterns that we all monitor and watch. Um, but I guess in terms of preparation, it, it all comes down um, to risk first, right? And so let's say... I mean, for instance, let's let's talk about a, a perfect example, right? So um, this September FOMC meeting was potentially pivotal for quite a long time, right? Why would that be pivotal? Uh, it's the first time in which we've got a cut over the last hiking period, right? We've hiked the fastest in which we've ever hiked in history. Um, and so this is the first time in which we cut. Right, and we cut 50 bips. Why do we cut 50 bips in tw instead of 25? Well, if you look at the history of the Fed, the Fed usually likes to come out strong to make a presence. It's everything is in in form of a perception, right? And so um, the perception is that okay, they're going to come out and they're going to take a hard stance, and um, they they mean business, right? They know if they show a hard a hard show of their cards that the market likely is going to react. But at the end of the day, the question is, how do you know? Um, and the answer is you don't, right? And I think that is super important to understand as a trader is as much prep work as we do, right? As much as we know and can speculate, right? The Fed projected that they were going to cut rates for an extreme amount of time, right? They forward projected this. You had Fed speakers that pivoted publicly, right? Which are tells in which the policy is going to change. Um, there's so many different things that are going to be interpreted as a trader that make them make decisions about the future. That's our job. Um, but to keep it simple, that rate cut in particular, there's two ways in which to think about it. Yes, absolutely. They could have, uh, they, they came out and made a hard stance and the market bottomed out and, and we bid up since, right? I mean, back then, um, ETH was priced at 2300 roughly, give or take 100 points, right? But August, late August, it was incredibly volatile. We sold off into it, right? So you get that, that pre-FOMC announce or trade, basically, um, where everybody kind of gears up. Knowing that... Um, Putting on size on an institutional side, getting long the market before that was a must, right? And the reason for that is the market might not be there when you're ready to put on the size, right? And so the reason I say that is because absolutely institutional side of the trade is 
you got to for or you have to forward look whether that's two weeks six months all these kind of durations uh and you have to express an opinion that's that's the job um but the two outcomes are this the market loves it or the market doesn't like it right and the reason for that would be okay the fed came out and showed their hand 50 bips why would they show their hand of 50 bips they know the economy is a lot worse off than they're publicly saying right what if the market sells off in fear right it partly did that during COVID, right? Where the market was dictating somewhat of the narrative where the Fed was cutting rates basically and continue to cut rates and cut rates and cut rates. And we would bottom for a day, rally in the spoos, right? And you just get a massive rally that would basically get sold off into the close, right? And the reason for that is the market's saying that there's still risk, right? And so as we think about the macro, um, we still have to to fundamentally understand that that moving size is a problem. And so while macro could be good, it's always about how it's perceived. And so if the market were to perceive that it were to be bad, we have to simplify it as traders, right? Where do we want to partake in the market? Well, we want to partake today over 66,800. If we trade under 66,800, we're cautious, if not flat the market. We just don't want to partake. I think knowing when not to trade is probably the only thing you can control when you're dealing with a variable that's basically unpredictable. I don't wow. know if that, yeah, that, 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 that helps. Yeah. Um, it just, it does, it's, it does sound uh, stressful. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, uh, so let me uh, get this straight. Uh, so in terms of uh, you have a proprietary way of um, evaluating uh, fair fair value. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, so and, and that's it. You don't care about other traders or anything. You have your proprietary way. And uh, it, it's at some of these lines on your uh, chart on the left there. Uh, this is where I want to get filled at these areas on the low uh, and um, uh, as much as you can, uh, basically. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, and, uh, uh, and and that's because you have quantitatively back tested this uh, over years. Uh, I know John has been uh, looking at this, I've uh, been perfecting this over the years. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Any, uh, I mean, when you wake up in the morning and you're you're looking at this and you're like, okay, you know, these are my levels. I, I'm looking to get on size here if I can. Right. Yeah. So um, to kind of, yeah, to, to tell the little bit of the story, yeah, this, uh, this software and analytics uh, started back in the S&P pits 35 years ago, back in the, the late 80s and 90s. Um, it still exists to this day and it has been kind of built on past, uh, basically passing around pink sheets that everybody had in the pit back then. Right. And so um, what is incredibly valuable about this is it's a risk overlay. Right. And so if our mandate is to come in and buy, right, where we want to buy it and we want to get it on with the best amount of size. Um, but also it tells us the flip side of the coin, right? And to kind of allude to what we just talked about, where it's the trader never knows, that's absolutely true. Right. And so that's another side that I don't think is widely talked about enough is our job is to make the best decisions we can. Um any given day you can be wrong, right? And that's that is the business, right? And so while everybody wants to make money every single day, a lot of our time as traders is spent within the churn, within the job. It's incredibly frustrating. Um, and, but understanding where to limit your risk, understanding where to put on your risk, absolutely, right? And so regardless of the news, I am thinking about positioning in terms of, okay, there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of strangles that have been bought, right? So 45,000 puts versus the 95,000 calls, right? Does that matter to me here and now? No, those are in the D's duration. But for a little bit of technicality on the option side, those do hold a delta, right? And those do hold a gamma. And so those delta flows 
absolutely impact how dealers are positioning in the market, uh, which is important to me, right? We're kind of in the middle of the road here, right at 67,000, um, but I always will have it in the back of my head, right? And so while this is kind of a weekly time frame, we also have larger time frames, monthly, quarterly, yearly, uh, that transition higher, right? So if we were to trade to uh, those 95,000 levels, right? I know that that delta is going to be 50, right? How do I know that? At the money worth 50 delta. I can price out those strangles. I know what those positions are worth in terms of nominal value, right? And I know where that P&L is against both the dealer that sold them that and the trader that bought, right? And so how does that matter? Well, We'll get into it in another another time, but that might be your resting order sitting here at seventy thousand. That might be a delta adjustment, right? Um, and so, yes, absolutely, the price overlay is very important. The prep in terms of understanding the macro, understanding all these kind of things, all these factors, positioning, really matters uh, to get the full picture of the market. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of curious because like, um, and I actually would, would like to kind of uh, uh, um, maybe um, dive into a little bit of the option side because um, maybe, I mean, this is, that's a really nice tool for you to have uh, to be able to, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to get in here in the, in the uh, spot or, in, you know, the, uh, uh, underline. uh, however, you know, I'm going to do this and that with the options in, in here to be able to kind of, um, uh, mitigate the risk or maybe, uh, have a little more flexibility, uh, with the sizing. Right. Yeah. So specifically, are you asking about kind of like hedging strategies or just how to utilize options when well, trading? Suppose, yeah. I mean, like, um, let's suppose you, you have to get a thousand, a thousand lot on uh, here. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you're going to look at this in, now in a, in a more complex level uh, way due to the options. But how would you, I don't know, just go through maybe a, a scenario on how you would do that. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple ways to think about this. So um, this is going to get a little bit technical. So if you have any questions, let me know. But spot markets, future markets, perpetual futures markets, those are what are considered to be Delta One products, right? Futures, perpetuals, they may be a little different, but theoretically, right, if the underlying goes up by a dollar, that, um, that derivative should also go up by a dollar, right? And so... That is what we deem to be a one delta, right? And so in the option space, it's a lot more fun, right? And so those are linear, those are linear products. Options are nonlinear products. So they have convexity, they have concavity. Um, they have all these components that are a little bit different that we know as in finance and in trading as your Greeks, right? So you have your delta component. Um, you have your gamma component, right? Which is your rate of change of delta, right? You have your theta component, right? Which is your rate of change of the option through a duration of time. Right. And then you have your Vega component, which is your change of the option in a in terms of volatility. And then you have your row component, right? Which is your risk free rate and uh in the market, right? All of these components basically build up what's considered to be a vanilla options contract, right? And so when I say vanilla options contract, there's multiple different contracts. Um a vanilla option is a call and a put. Right. And those are what most people are familiar with. Um, and so there's so many different strategies in which you can utilize when you are trading to mitigate risk. Right. And so what I, I mean, to think about options, you have to think about dimensions. Right. And so for spot trading futures, right. Is the stock going to go up? Is the stock going to go down? It's two dimensional. Right. Adding time component to your equation gives you a third dimension. Or sorry, adding volatility will give you a third dimension, right? That two-dimensional plane now has mountains in the form of volatility, in the form of a volatility surface, right? Um, that adds a third dimension, right? And then time, and through time, we'll add that fourth dimension, right? And so options 
contracts, trading options to me is a superior product because it gives you the ability to express an opinion in a very capitally efficient way, um, but it express an opinion on multiple different dimensions, right? And so um, a way in which to approach that is to think about, okay, well, those next two dimensions, right? So third dimension and fourth dimension. If I need to put a thousand lot on and I'm concerned about the trade going under this price, well, one, we can think about it regularly two-dimensionally, right? So my stop loss here is around that 6,600, more in that 66,800. I can look at the daily puts, see what those are priced, right? But in order to understand if those are relatively cheap or relatively expensive, I have to think about them in relation to volatility and I have to think about them in relation to time, right? And then I also have to think about them in relation to my, are they physically settled or are they dollar settled? There's so many different aspects of these things. Um, so simplest forms give a strategy is, um, let's say that, okay, I'm trying to put some size on. Um, I think that the market's going to base here. I think it's going to be a digestive trade through Friday at the close, but I am concerned about that risk to the downside, a collar, right? A risk reversal, right? I have a positive skew, um, let's say in the seven day, these are all hypothetical, just just to uh, to make it simple, but it's the same thought process. So I'll go look at my skew in the options market and say, okay, well, that aligns, right? The 1025s, the oct um, expiry, I'm could be digestive through there. I think that fits well. It's a positive skew, right? What does a skew mean? It means the calls are going to be more expensive to the puts. So I'm going to get some edge selling the calls, right? Well, if I sell the calls, I can find the puts. Right. Let's I can sell a seventy and buy a, or actually, sorry. Let's let's tighten it up because our risk is even tighter. I can sell a sixty-eight and I could buy a sixty-seven, and it's basically at zero cost. We'd have to go look, but that's how I would that's how I would look at it, right? And the reason for that is, okay, well, at that particular point in time, my risk is I'm wrong in terms of the market being digestive, but I at least get to partake in some part of that positive growth, right? Of the, of the underlying in relation to dollars, right? So um, if I sell a, seven, or sell a 69 here, buy a 67, let's say that's at zero, then I get 400 of upside here at zero cost. Basically, I just work this tight range. So as it comes down, I wanna buy these up. As it goes higher, I have the opportunity to sell them or do nothing, right? And that upside is capped because I sold the calls, right? I sold the rights to those assets in the future at that strike price and at that duration. But I also protect my downside. So collars are great. Risk reversals, that's another way to call them. Fences, uh, those are great for working kind of a range. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I mean, it becomes, like like you said, multidimensional uh, at that point, uh, which uh it, it sounds like that that kind of alleviates maybe some of the stress um instead of the uh directional um uh moves here um but uh, uh you just have much more flexibility is what it sounds like right yeah no exactly exactly uh let's see here we have a, a question from uh maxime <laughs> uh he's wondering what you would do differently now as a retail trader with all this institutional experience yeah um so the difference here is the decision making and learning how to kind of trade with larger size is the key factors in which i would still carry over right so decision making is the exact same um how i would think about approaching the market would be a little different right so instead of um, instead of buying off these lows, right? Let's say I have a smaller bankroll. I might wait. This this level 66,730 is the validation that this is a correct point to buy. I probably would wait to buy that, right? Because if you're telling me that statistically this level is going to hold by 66% of the time, okay, well, I know statistically the odds are in my favor. But if this level holds, and then higher than this level, which is your daily directional, then there's an 85% chance that the scaling or the, the trade's gonna scale 
to the UT1, which is at 70,000, which aligns perfectly right here with this book map level, why not take the 85% chance, right? That's, that's the only difference. Strategically, I would think about the market the exact same, right? So if the, if the big institutions have to take the most amount of risk, right, because they can't take it later, I'd wait for them to take the risk, right? If the level breaks, I don't have to partake, right? I can be a lot more patient. I can let them take on all the risk. And basically, once they fight it out in the trenches, which are kind of defined here, right, in these areas, right, these levels hold on the bid, and then we get a we get a press over here. Well, I'll just ride. I'll ride it out. There's no point in me fighting them. Um, I'll wait to see who the winner is, and then I'll just jump on board with the winner. I'm not a huge bandwagon fan in terms of uh, sports that I enjoy, but uh, in trading, it makes a lot of sense. Wow. Wow. Great, great answer. Um, so uh, let's see uh, if there's any more questions in here. Uh, there's one more coming in. And uh, um, just uh, some really, really uh, interesting things uh, also regarding market timing uh, that you had mentioned uh, and um, uh, fitting that into the plan. Uh, wondering about uh, correlated markets uh, as well. Uh, you know, are you looking at uh, uh, a lot of correlations, or are you just looking at your proprietary levels uh, mostly? The information, so yeah, so the information in which I take into account, I some traders enjoy kind of like a um, being tunnel visioned, right? So less information, the better. They want to just point and shoot. I am kind of a big picture thinker, so I think it's going to be a little bit catered to the trader, right? And so I really enjoyed to try to understand, okay, where are risk assets, right? Okay, well, all of a sudden the odds are favored into Trump, right? Where are those flows going in, right? Because I know institutions do have to put on size, so they're not going to wait until the winner of the election to put all that size on. They're going to get a start going. They might buy some out of the money options just in case the trade runs away from them, right? Um, so I'll look for tells there. Um, so yeah, those, I mean, those are, those are going to be, uh, those are key factors. Can you actually, can you repeat the question? I want to make sure that I answered it fully. Well, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, maybe it's, it's, they're already baked into your proprietary levels there, but like, uh, uh, looking at, uh, different correlated markets, like, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, um, uh, the S and P is going up, you know, the, uh, bonds are going down or the, you know, crude oil is doing this compared to gold is doing that. Um, uh, and, uh, how would you look at that maybe, uh, when trading size, uh, especially in the crypto market? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So, um, to answer your question, yeah, it's, it's the same answer. So some, some traders like to kind of keep tunnel vision. I like it all right. So, um, Absolutely, I'm looking for correlations. However, at the end of the day, my mandate still stays the same. And the reason for that is trading is incredibly simple in terms of the fact that you want to buy low and sell high, right? That's all you want to do. We complicate it in terms of the execution and all these kind of things. Execution part of the trading is really hard. Um, so in its simplest forms, I like to say tunnel visioned. However, understanding the flows of the market matter, right? If the global economy, right, or the world has X amount of dollars, that means the world can only buy X amount of things with X dollars, right? That changes based on monetary easing, that changes based on leverage, that changes based on policy, that changes on all these different aspects. So absolutely, I'm looking at that. Um, but in my day-to-day -day action, I'm taking a macro sense, making sure that I do all the all the due diligence in terms of okay, China's going into a monetary easing, right? The U.S. is also on board with rate cuts, right? That creates a further liquid environment. You would expect bonds rates to go lower. You would expect uh, risk assets to go higher. You might see over a spillover effect in crypto, right? And you get that that runaway trade, and and uh, you see a pricing up in Bitcoin. That's followed by an Ethereum, right? These are all macro thesis that I'm thinking about. But at the end of the day, if it's not happening, the price is the biggest factor, and I have to trade the price. 
Hmm. Yeah, yeah, great, great answer. Um, let's see here. Well, we've gone over the hour period. Uh, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, if you don't mind, Spencer, we'll just, uh, uh, they took some time to put them in. Uh, Malek is uh, asking uh, since yesterday uh, at uh, 67,840 to 67,380 has been a sell zone from an institutional perspective against your current analysis. What's happening there? Um, okay, so 68,740. So basically, eight, eight, 67, 840, and then uh, 67, uh, 380. Yeah, I mean, it, it's right in alignment with what we're expecting, right? So that's that level. That's this level. Um, it's digestion around the, the weekly, what we call to be directional, right? The expectation based on book map two is we retrace down to these levels. We got bids here in the perpetual book. The expectation those bids will hold. If they don't hold, that's our cue to say we need to at least downsize, if not reassess our thesis, or maybe not even partake in the market. Right. Um, right now, if we look at book map, you got 200 sitting here on the offer that are kind of on a smaller scale, but the the next level that's showing up is at 70. It's relatively light with just normal offers here uh, in the perpetual contracts, right? Now, as we trade higher, where those offers step into the book are going to be incredibly important. Important. Do they step in at that 68, 400 level, right? Nobody's sitting there. That's your previous week's close. Why is that an important level? Institutions make decisions based on the weekly close and the weekly open, right? And the weekly high and the weekly low. Think about it. Um, and yes, so if absolutely. all of a sudden we trade them. higher and see some of that, well, that that's another data point. But based on uh, what we're seeing here and now, the thesis has proven that, that we are digesting in this range until we break out of this range, either to the upside or the downside, is where Incredibly we will get our final answer, right? It. Right, so you get yeah. that. that um, let's F1 see. Uh, uh, Yasmin is asking: uh, Is there any specific characteristics to different, differentiate a manipulation move from a real move through structure points or key levels? I would say absolutely yes, um, but the fun part about this is it's just speculation, right? Um, manipulation moves, sure. Moving size. Um, is not always easy right and so if you are seeing sellers here that are sitting on the book and holding it here and then buyers down here that are sitting on the book and holding it here right there's probably a reason there right if if i was in a thousand lot today i'd buy them here where am i going to sell them well the moment we trade over this um this level here which is our previous day close which fundamentally is a uh positive move for the day on Bitcoin. If we trade right back under that, well, I'm looking for the market to scale. If it doesn't scale, I'm a seller, right? I'm not going to sell off the thousand lot, but I need to downsize, right? Because I can't wait to hit the book down here, right? There's 300 sitting down here. There's another 240 here, but I might as well downsize a little bit, right? Until we trade right back over that. And if we trade right back over, I'll put it back on and all those kind of things. So it's it's very much the reason I call these the trenches is because that's what they are. Um, it's a lot of work, and as a trader, you're not guaranteed that this level is going to hold, right? So as long as we're aware of where we're where we want to get out, then we know how we want to partake in the trade. Yeah, if you can address that, like uh, I mean, like getting in and and spending all this time and effort. Uh, in, you know, trying to uh, average your, your position. But what about getting out, especially if it's breaking a key level like that? Uh, how do you handle something like that? Yeah, that's the um, that's the that's the most important question, right? So it's a a question of time and it's a question of speed, right? And so the reason I say that is because if you're telling me the market, if the market breaks sixty six eight hundred, and immediately it's going to go to sixty six hundred. That's a problem, right? I'll I'll market, hit market the book, right? I'll hit every single bid that I see, right? If you're telling me that potentially we might do a basing area here, we trade under the previous day low, we pop right back over, we trade under. I have time, 
right? So while I might downsize and these might not be great fills, the moment we pop back over, I'm, I'm putting it right back on, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm working off of this low and then I'm working off of this low and then these lows, right? Until it's, it's time to let the thing go and prove the thesis right. Wow. Wow. Great. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, getting out, uh, is uh, just trying to get as much liquidity as you can, uh, as quickly as you can. That is it. That is it. Yeah. 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 Well, and you, but you've also hedged with your options. Uh, so that's, uh, taken up some of the, uh, uh, risk. Right. Yeah. So in that, in that scenario too, right. So if you're just trading, uh, the underlying, right, the spot or or the futures, right? You can you can just hit the stop losses. You can also uh, look for the liquidity and and look for the bids across the market. Um, if you do have the options on, that does give you the you're selling the upside gamma, is what it's called, right? The explosive move higher on the day or over the next three days. But what it does give you is peace of mind. Um, so when you do make that trade in terms of the option, yes, it is a hedged position. However, um, it doesn't come without a cost. So, All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, uh, uh, yeah. And any other kind of, uh, resources for us to learn more, I guess uh, your stream, uh, on, uh, during, during the week, uh, every week here at, uh, uh, in, in discord and, and YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are trying to grow grow the uh, the room in there in Discord. So if you enjoyed hopping on today uh, and anything that I said, I will be in there. Um, I know there's a lot of complexity to some of the topics, um, but uh, as whenever I step off the desk and can answer questions, I'll be in there. So. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, Spencer, this has been uh, this has been great, and uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, really insightful uh and um yeah what a it you know just uh makes it seem like a very uh challenging job that's for sure it does bring uh it does bring a little bit more complexities to it um but i think as a trader this is this is the game you want to be involved in yeah yeah Excellent. All right. Well, uh, let's, uh, we'll wrap it up and, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, look forward to, uh, doing more of these things with you in the, in the future. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye right. everybody. Bye.